Ask, who wasn't able to be here this year, so I thank her for uh, tapping me on the shoulder for her spot. And I'll just wait for... <coughs> there we go. Uh, thank you. So, um, we healthcare professionals, as we know, find consultations with parents who resist or who don't vaccinate their children somewhat challenging. Um, but during and during our early research, Australian providers described these consultations as kind of descending into adversarial exchanges with parents that they described as difficult or challenging or ignorant or impossible. And um, their kind of big beef was that those they felt like these parents were. Uh, questioning their professional integrity and frustrating their efforts to provide appropriate preventative care for the children that they had presented. And so there's little wonder, I guess, that many providers kind of disengaged with the conversation, preferring to avoid it altogether, or um, refusing or threatening to refuse to treat the children of parents who um, declined vaccination. But um, we know that uh, healthcare professionals, as um, Joe so eloquently showed us last night, um, still influence parents. They're, they're still the most important uh, influence on parents' vaccination behaviour. Um, and they are in Australia as they are, I guess, in the US and in the UK. So um, parents who decide not to vac and, and we know that parents who decide not to vaccinate or not to continue vaccinating their children um, often trace their decision to stop vaccinating or not to vaccinate with to an unsatisfying interaction with a healthcare professional. So that influence can run both ways. It's not doesn't just run in, in one direction. Um, and they report then feeling kind of dismissed, alienated or unable to trust their healthcare providers. But hesitant or declining parents who subsequently decide to vaccinate their children also cite, often cite a, con a consultation with a healthcare professional that has reassured them and enabled them to change their minds. So hesitating parents who participated in our early research uh, focus groups told us that they actually want more vaccination information, but they want it from a trusted healthcare professional. Um, and Interestingly, even those who accepted vaccination wanted more information and they wanted it from a healthcare professional. But the fear of being labelled as an anti-vaxxer or as crazy or as a not good parent um, prevented them from actually approaching their healthcare professionals with their questions. They actually wanted to be invited to ask their questions and they wanted to know that it was safe to ask those questions within that consultation. So in response to that, somewhat, we um, developed a system that we call SKY, and SKY stands for Sharing Knowledge About Immunisation. It's a system of clinical communication support that aims to reduce or prevent the harms associated with unsatisfying consultations with primary care providers by equipping those providers with the tools and skills they need to identify parents' readiness to accept vaccination, to modify their goals for the consultation accordingly, and to use really common clinical communication skills to achieve those goals. So SKY is based on the vaccination communication framework, which the repeat offenders that Saad so eloquently described earlier will be very familiar with, um, and it employs a kind of a triage and treat model. So you can see that SKY um, begins with a recall or reminder system, ideally, that um, then goes on to ask parents uh, the question, what questions do you have uh, or what questions would you like answered before getting your child's needles? And it's important to note that that word, word, the use of the word needles there is very kind of culturally bound. Uh, in Australia, that's what parents, that's the, the word that parents use and that's kind of the least threatening word we think. Um, in the UK, it might be jabs. Um, in the US, it might be shots. You know, though you need to kind of do some work with your population to work out, you know, what would be the most appropriate kind of reference term there. Um, but more importantly, it equips providers to recognise responses that might indicate that a parent is hesitating about vaccination, that they are resist, going to resist or that they are resistant to the idea of accepting vaccination or at risk of resisting and treat them appropriately. Uh, so we conducted as part of the kind of overall Sky Package development research um, 
uh, research that aimed to identify communication strategies already used by um, expert clinical vaccination communicators to build trust and to reassure parents of the safety and utility of routine childhood vaccination. So we, we actually recorded and transcribed consultations conducted in, uh, by consultant paediatricians. So paediatricians in Australia are a tertiary referral service. Um, you have to get a referral from a general practitioner to see a paediatrician uh, covered by Medicare, um, which is a almost single payer um, uh, insurance system, a bit like the NIA, uh, the um, National Health, but in the UK, but not quite as good. I, I didn't say that out loud. Um, <laughs> so we analysed the transcripts of our eight conversations to identify the linguistic and structural features um, of those consultations and the effects those features had both on the, the parents but also on the provider. And we're using that analysis to inform the further development of our SKY system resources and training. I want to say that this research strategy generated a really rich and nuanced data set. I know eight consultations doesn't sound like very many. It's quite difficult to get our practitioners, our paediatricians to agree to have their consultations recorded and it was quite difficult to get the parents to agree as well. So there was a lot of trust building involved in recruitment there. Uh, so I won't be able to do justice to all the conclusions in 10 minutes, but we have lots of lunches and things like that. Uh, so what we saw was much, in, in many ways we saw a lot of the things that we expected. So we expected, um, as we expected, these expert clinicians um, employed a range of really sophisticated communication strategies to establish and maintain therapeutic relationships that were strong, um, to explore concerns and values of the parents and to provide them with de very often very detailed vaccination information. Um, most made a clear and apparently personalised recommendation to vaccinate or to begin vaccinating the child and all but one of the consultations we saw resulted in the parents indicating an intention uh, to accept vaccination or to consider doing so. So, you know, these are some of the most and, and this population was some of the most highly hesitant parents um, in the country. So um, our ling linguists had a look at the transcripts and what they saw uh, happening was um, that the the providers developed um, a sense of solidarity and involvement using phrases like, then we can talk about some of your concerns and the options we have. Um, they used, they expressed their confidence, not just in vaccine, but in their capacity to have the conversation. They made it very clear that they weren't frightened of talking about it. They were so confident in the safety of vaccinations and, that they, and their capacity to kind of answer parents' questions that they said things like, I'm not concerned. I'd love to talk about this some more. I can see that that is difficult, challenging, logical, um, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, they also used lots of kind of um, empathic uh, expressions to align themselves as a, with the parent, like deeply worrying, unpleasant or serious. They validated the parent's kind of values and concerns. Oh, that's a reasonable suggestion. They, um, they validated parents' own doubts about their kind of mistaken um, or misaligned beliefs about vaccination. They said things like, oh yes, I think it would be worthwhile for you to consider vaccinating so-and-so because you are around horses a lot and that puts you at risk for tetanus, right? Uh, yes, I think it would be worthwhile to do. It is something that would be worthwhile to do. And oh, how horrible in response to a story about, you know, something... Uh, that they believed was an adverse event. They talked. Um, they established engagement, so they engaged themselves with their patients by saying things like, I understand you're here because you have some questions. So immediately kind of opened that uh, safe space to answer those questions um, and really personalised their recommendations and their advice. My advice is to immunise Angela today because... Uh, and... But... So, but we also, it also, our analysis also revealed that even these skill, really skilled, experienced communicators struggled to organise their consultations or attempted to organise them according to their own mental models. And so they got very, very long, some of them. The longest one was 85 minutes, right? So you can, you can see that's not going to work in primary care, in a primary care situation. Um, but the problem was that when they, when they, failed to organise it or they tried to organise it according to their own mental models, the parents resisted and returned again and again to trying to achieve the things that they wanted to achieve within the consultation. 
And, it, and another thing we noticed was that the provider's concern to build rapport resulted in extensive use of a communication style often described in motivational interviewing um, literature as a following style, which is really useful for building rapport and eliciting parents' concerns and values. But when you overuse it, it can lead to long, unfocused consultations um, because it allows the parents to lead the conversation. We also noticed several incidences where the parents, um, the participating providers didn't respond to subtle bids for reassurance from parents or recognise that their expressions of motivation to accept vaccination. And motivational interviewing literature again recognises the potential of those expressions to drive behave change and describes them as examples of change talk. So you can see here, this was about three quarters of the way through quite a long conversation and for about 45 minutes. And it was only at this point that the mother, when the mother said, no, no, I think it's just that we had a difficult labour with her. And she was born with an APGAR of three, oh, and sorry, four. And after a minute, she was APGAR nine. I think her score was nine. So all the doctors we've seen said that she's totally okay, but still, and the doctor twigged and he said, oh, so you have a nagging worry. And the father who was within this consultation said, exactly. And the mother said, that's the reason he asked you about the neurological things. And the father said, and that's the reason. That's the reason why we're here. So it took kind of 35 minutes to get to this point, which was actually the crux of the issue. And this family went on to, um, ex you know, to express real confidence in, um, in an in like a really confident intention to return to their primary care care provider for vaccinate, to begin vaccination. So we suggest that um, closer attention to the structure of, con of the consultation might result in more satisfying and effective encounters. We've modified a model of consultation structure called the Cal Calgary-Cambridge model, uh, which offers a way for clin clinicians to maintain control of the structure of the consultation while also organising the information in response to the parents' agendas and val agenda and values. So it involves eliciting parents' concerns to saturation early, working with parents val uh, to clarify and prioritise their concerns, eliciting their values, negotiating and maintaining a parent-centred agenda, structuring information in response to the parents' most important concerns, values and priorities, and planning further treatment aligned to the parents' values. So that further treatment might be a follow-up, a recall, uh, a referral, it might be a, perhaps a modified um, vaccination schedule, it might be starting with one vaccination that the parent's comfortable with to give them a lived experience of kind of the safety of it, um, and also recognising and amplifying drivers of vaccination acceptance early um, to make the consultations more efficient by meeting the parent's needs for considered reassurance. Bland reassurance doesn't seem to help, right? But considered reassurance, where a parent feels like you've really actually heard their concerns, you've engaged with those concerns, um, and then you can give reassurance with kind of, we, um, psychologists sometimes call it sticky praise, because there's reasons that, that um, align to the parent's values. So um, learning to recognise, uh, uh, eliciting and confirming any doubts parents have about the validity of their concerns or focusing their attention on the kind of risks or practical consequences of not vaccinating. And learning to recognise and elicit those expressions of change talk can enable health professionals to offer kind of valued con congruent reasons to accept vaccination. Which leads us to where we're going now, which is that we are, um, we've incorporated all of these kind of ideas into a beta version of the Sky System Resources and Training, which we delivered to part the participating paediatricians. And the next stage of our evaluation will involve analysis, further analysis of um, consultations between the same providers and different parents conducted after training, and we'll use that data to further develop. Um, the Sky System resources and training for use in primary care. So it'd be slightly different. Thank you.